Welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite, a show that will help you transform your marketing from mere messaging to programs that break the rules and make a difference. Join the movement today and learn non-traditional techniques that give you an edge. Now, here's your chief marketing renegade, Drew Neiser. Listening to the interviews of parents of three American gold medal snowboarders, including two young ladies during the Winter Olympic Games this year, I was struck by a consistent theme. Each of them described their kids as daredevils from the earliest age, and notably, all of the parents embraced this characteristic rather than trying to suppress it. Now, that must have taken a bit of parental courage to ignore the risks, especially as their kids piled up bruises and cuts and sprains and broken bones along the way. And of course, the same could be said for the athletes themselves. Just a few months before Sean White won his third Olympic gold medal, he had had a terrible fall that required 65 stitches to put back together his battered face and head. Obviously, the risk-reward calculation paid off for this for these athletes. So here's my question for all you marketers. What risks are you prepared to take with your marketing? And in taking those risks, what will be the source of your courage? How much preparation will you do so that when you take these risks, it's less of a long shot and more of a calculated possibility. Which finally (laughs) brings me to my guest today, Rich Kyleberg, who is the VP of Corporate Marketing Communications at Aero Electronics. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Aero, chances are you don't work for a manufacturer because if you did, you know that Aero is a $24 billion global supplier of parts to over 100,000 customers. That's just about everyone who builds anything. I've known Rich now for several years through the CMO Club and have always admired his honesty and courage to do work that cuts through. Now, and in full disclosure, I've had a chance to work with Rich and his team in the last year, and I can attest with just pinpoint accuracy that he is a renegade thinker of the first order. So, Rich, welcome to the show. Thank you, Drew. It's it's great to hear your voice. <laughs> well, that's nice of you to say. Now, the first question I have to ask is this: When I was thinking about these uh, these young kids, I was thinking, God, I just there were so many times in my life as a kid where I took incredible risks. How about you? Do you have a favorite sort of story of of when you took a uh, you know was a, were a bit of a daredevil? <laughs> yeah, it's I love I love I love listening to the way you you started this and and. It really hit me, Drew, when you talked about um, the risk that the, maybe the, un- the unseen risk of the parents allowing these kids to, to get, crash around on their on their journey to be successful. Um, because when I look back on my life, maybe I think I wasn't such a risk taker. But if you asked my mother, she'd say, "Oh my goodness, I, I just about killed her." <laughs> <laughs> I remember. Being sent to a little Boy Scout, uh, little jamboree or something out by a lake, and my mom was so happy that that I was going to be gone for camping for a weekend, um, and so I was off with all the kids. and And one of the things to do was ride a bike, and well, it's okay to ride a bike, but I don't know. I just thought I, I, I needed for some reason to ride it faster or in, in some way, you know, uh, differently than, than other kids that were sane. Um, and, and the next thing I knew, I, I was I was hit by a truck. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, Drew, um, when I say hit by a truck, the truck wasn't actually moving. It was parked. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, you know, just coming around the corner real fast, like, you know, just taking a risk, and that risk did not exactly pay off as I saw my teeth flying in the air in slow motion and, and landing in the grass wow. and knocking my, knocking my teeth out. So my mom had hoped to have a quiet weekend, but within a couple hours of my departure, she'd gotten the call that, well, you know, your, your son has um, uh, crashed <laughs> bike into a park truck. Uh, my teeth were knocked out. It was interesting. It, it, it went in slow motion. I was actually able to go to the place where they had fallen uh, and pick them up and take them off to the oh dentist. Oh, my gosh. You know, um, the risk-reward equation there really did not uh, pan out well for me. 
See, and you, uh, you learned your lesson, I think, which is, which is funny because, you know, when I was a kid, there was one giant hill in the back bay area of Newport Beach. California. And we, the, when I think about the things that we did as kids, or maybe 10, 11, 12, we would find things to go down on and like a flexi flyer head first, no helmet. And we had to get to 30, 40 miles an hour. And then our favorite was we took a big wheel, we took the pedals off the axle so you could just put your feet on it. And here we are, big kids, on this little tiny tricycle, if you will, and we'd go racing down this thing. Now, I didn't lose a tooth, so, you know, I live to tell about it. But, you know, there's a funny thing that they tell parents is that... uh uh, you're, that fear is a sign, an early sign of intelligence. So clearly I wasn't a very intelligent kid. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's pretty funny. But you do, I mean, if you, if you boil that down and you say, well, where was the reward in any of this? I mean, and I'm not even sure, because there wasn't reward. I think maybe for an Olympic athlete, there may be at some point this reward that you might, you might stand on that podium and you might hear your national anthem played for you or something. But just a kid running around crashing around like that, where is the reward? And I, I might, I might suggest that in some ways, uh, the reward is, is not so obvious. It's, it's just that, it's just that riding that, that bike a little faster, being on that big wheel a little crazy or something is, is, is better than the alternative for people, which is the alternative is, is mediocrity or the alternative is, you know, just not doing something extraordinary and, and i'm not saying extraordinary positive i'm just ex- extraordinary like different yeah. just not doing something different and and maybe even in some ways um the fear the you know the motivation is fear of fear of being mediocre interesting see i think i, I can boil it down for me it was just need for speed I just, I like, oh, was it yeah, an I, adrenaline? I like, yeah, no, I mean, and I still ski too fast just for, for that. Uh, yeah. uh, I should know better, but, uh, I wanted to tell one other story that I think is relevant to this thing when, uh, I will never forget this moment where they used to have a daughter's breakfast, a father's breakfast at my daughter's school. And the Mm -hmm. headmaster tells this story about Margaret Thatcher and how she used to, when she was a little kid, climb up to the very top of the ladder in their big library. And the mother would say, be careful, Maggie. And the father would say, let her climb, let her climb. And I thought, that's wonderful, you know? So part, right. of, part of the objective of this show is to let you climb and to get you mm. excited about some of the risks. So let's move into that area, Rich. You know, um, mm-hmm. let's just talk about, uh, uh, well, before I do that, I'm sorry, I have to go back to something, which is you mm-hmm. were an English major at Stanford and that yeah. intrigues me because, uh, and by the way, for the folks listening, he also got an MBA at Harvard, but you were an English major, which would have been way too hard for me. I could have never gotten all that <laughs> reading done, but you did that. And I still believe that that's a really important major for kids. If you learn to, to read, uh, I mean, if you can write, you can, you can think, but how important and what do you think of that major when you look back at, at on that as, as a life experience? Oh, I, I actually think that it's critical. You know, I, I think that I think that liberal arts majors like that, whether it's art history or, or English or uh, history or philosophy or, you know, are are oftentimes criticized uh, because we almost have fetishized uh, science, technology, engineering, math. Um, but uh, I found in high school that, and, and I guess they had these SATs, you'll get tested, and I, I tested better at math than I did on in English. That's how they broke it down was math and language, I think, English. And um, I was always better at math, but for some reason I liked uh, English better. I liked communication better. I liked the uh, subjective. I liked reading and, and talking about books or seeing movies. I just enjoyed it. I wasn't as good at it. Um, as I was with math, but I just enjoyed it more. And I've always felt as though in life that, um, you know, if you, if you know what your strengths are, uh, it's fine. If you have a strong right arm, well, then you can lift a lot of weights with your right arm and that'll be great. And you'll have a really strong right arm, but you're not doing yourself any favors, uh, unless you also work on your weaknesses in, in your left arm. And, and, and I was weaker in languages and communication. And so I focused on it. And 
I, I think that for those of us who I, I aren't born, you know, with some great um, virtuous virtuoso talent uh, that just is just genetically bestowed upon us. Um, the way that we improve in life is just by doing it over and over and over. You know, the more we do, the better we get at something. And so, if the more we do are things that we don't really enjoy, or things that are that come as being hard to us, the better we'll get at filling those things out and being more balanced. Um, the 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 English major, as it relates to being a marketing professional, I think really helps when it comes down to. Uh, the aspect of marketing that has to do with storytelling, okay? It doesn't help much in terms of perhaps, um, you know, search engine optimization or some of the, uh, you know, media media planning and buying, some of the things that are based more in, in math and science. But when it comes to customer journey mapping or trying to understand um, empathy for customers, uh, having, a, having a liberal arts background and, you know, if not degree, but... Um, interest, I think, has been incredibly valuable. I'd like to say that I took time out to read all of the sacred scriptures. If you read the Bhagavad Gita, the Torah, the Quran, um, the Dhammapada, uh, the Tao, and the Gospels, if you read those books, you will have read what about 90 to 95 percent of the human uh, population kind of believes from a spiritual standpoint. And then you can have a con conversation with a Muslim or, or with a Hindi from a perspective of having actually read their sacred texts as opposed to having heard them reported to you by, you know, whatever organization, whatever bias they might have. So uh, to get back to my point, which is, you know, empathy and understanding for others, I think that when you read literature from around the world or you study um, the way that archetypes are developed, you study film, you study philosophy, uh, it, it, it provides the marketer with the tools that are really required, I think, to, to be a good storyteller. And that's a as perfect well. place. So first of all, we're going to, we're going to take a break and allow people to go read all of those, um, <laughs> scriptures. Yeah, right. And, uh, hopefully they'll come back after having done that and listened to the rest of the show. So stay tuned. We're going to come back, uh, and we're going to talk about some of the, uh, really amazing things that, uh, Rich and his team have done at Arrow. So stay with us. You've been listening to another great interview on Renegade Thinkers Unite with Drew Neiser, but the value doesn't end there. As a listener, you can download a free ebook from Drew, Renegade Thinkers, interviews with 11 trailblazing CMOs any business can learn from, top marketing thought leaders and proven executives from Time Warner, American Express, and Chico's, and others. Get your free copy at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook for listeners only at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook. Okay, we're back, and my guest is Rich Kyleberg, VP of Corporate Marketing and Communications at Aero Electronics. And we we spent the first uh, bit talking about risk and and reward and uh, and preparation for a, a career as a as a storyteller. Let's let's go back to you joined Aero seven years ago. Let's go back to the situation that you found and how you went about getting to the campaign that uh, that you have uh, in place. Yeah, well, uh, the time that I joined Aero about oh seven change years ago, Aero was a great company. It was a great company before I got here. Had you know, I think fourteen, sixteen billion dollars in revenue worldwide. Um, it had it faced challenges, and you know some of those challenges came from the fact that it had acquired over a uh, hundred and say thirty companies, and most of those in, in just a matter of years, and really hadn't asked those companies once they'd been acquired to 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 fall in line with a common kind of uh, brand framework and so on, and so w the company just really had a hard time getting getting traction because people hadn't heard of Arrow, and they, they might in certain uh, parts of the world have heard of Sperla or Chip One Stop or other companies that acquired, but just 
uh, was just kind of an anonymous company. And, and it was so successful that you get kind of comfortable in that and thought, well, why should we have uh, a single uh, identity? We're, we're doing just great here. And so it was kind of like a holding company uh, of sorts. And, and there were competitors that were, you know, kind of ahead of Arrow. Um, the decision was made that, that the company would do better if we had a common identity. And um, that was pretty hard because the breadth of activity that Arrow did was so wide. It wasn't like you could say, hey, we make shoes or, you know, we're a pizza parlor. It uh, was a company that did everything from designing electronic devices to being primarily a, a components distributor to selling uh, computer systems to uh, value-added resellers and being the world's largest e-waste recycler. So you had all this different activity, and we needed to find a common uh, language, a common rallying cry for the company. Um, in order to do that, we reached out to the employees. We sent out a survey that wasn't easy to fill out. It wasn't, I like my job 1 to 10, I like my boss 1 to 10, you know. It was it was little boxes that said, how, how do you describe this company to your spouse? How do you describe this to your kids? You know, what, when this company is great, what is it doing? And we didn't offer any prizes or anything, but fully 25% of the company, which is actually a big number in terms of a response to That's something huge. like this. It was 3,000 people sent in responses to that request because they wanted to be a part of it something common. And when we read through those 3,000 responses that came to us in six languages we had to translate, um, what happened was after about 600 of them, you started to hear the same words repeated by people that worked here. You heard, we help, we work with, we partner with, you know. Um, it was always in technology because we're, we're, we're um, or in, you know, semiconductors or whatever part of the company they worked in. But it was always about uh, 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 technology. And it was always about trying to make a brighter future. And from that, we were able to distill this idea of guiding innovation forward. Yeah? And it, when we when we started telling people that this is what we stand for is guiding innovation forward, not selling semiconductors or not distributing this or that or whatever, but more talking about what we what we stand for, what we believe, you know, our values. And we took the, our values to market rather than our products or in our services. It resonated, and it didn't matter whether you were Chinese or you were from Argentina or you were in, in Europe or you were in Texas. These words resonated, and the entire company was able to come together around a few sets of, of words that didn't say what we did, they didn't say what we sold, they said what we believed. And, and, it, and, and that, that activity has really transformed the company, Drew. So uh, I want to break that down. And so those three words, guiding innovation forward, is such a, a great internal language. And I can see how, I mean, it's really sort of your why. Uh, if you if we had Simon Sinek on the thing, he'd be applauding right, right now. Um, so, but those are words that are internal. So how, yes. how do you, you know, and what kinds of things did you do to make this real? And what was the external articulation of this? Yeah, really, really smart, Drew. Because um, we did, we did get those words, and they were internal. And and one of the challenges we had was that they resonated so well with people that they wanted to make those words external because they made so much sense internally. And we had to say, no, 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 that those aren't. There's a difference between you know a, a marketing message and an you know an internal you know kind of values message. And so we had to translate. We had to offer also an external message, but. I think some companies go forward and they create, they worry about external messaging. They come up with messages that will work in the marketplace before they actually concern themselves with what the employees will tolerate or what employees will be inspired by. And those messages tend not to, not to succeed. So it was absolutely critical for us at Arrow first to get our messaging right for the employees. So they would get on board and they would rally and they would support these things. When we looked at an external message, and we took this idea of guiding innovation forward and we, we, we looked at what the company does and realized that with 100,000 100, customers and suppliers worldwide, that we really had one of the world's largest knowledge bases of technology usage. So we could actually tell what kinds of electronic devices, what the next, next, next coffee maker would look like, and whether it was a coffee maker or a cruise missile or an iPad or a tablet, we actually had some visibility into what the future of electronics and what the future of technology looked like because we worked with every every major innovator on earth, all the great names you've heard of, as well as you know, many of the names you've never heard of, like, you know, who invented the, the three-prong outlet, you know, or the 
or the uh, air conditioner, yeah? But we work with them all, and that gives us visibility. We've got all this data, and when we combined that data with really smart people, we we're able to get wisdom, and that wisdom manifested itself in something we call five years out, which we, we took to market to say even five years out, and it wasn't clear what that was, what that meant. So people would ask us, what, it, what, it, what on earth does five years out mean? Which for us was great because we didn't want something that was so clear. When you're working with technologists and engineers, they love a puzzle. They want to know, what, what, what does five years out mean? That's an invitation, frankly, to talk about your company. And we would say, we believe we're five years out because we have the ability to see out on the horizon of technology. Not, not, we're not looking out 15 years, which is flying cars and time machines and science fiction. You know, and we're not focused on this quarter. Hey, we're going to get you these, this stuff right now. You know, we'll solve the problem right now for you and, and just get run over. But this idea of being five years out, where you're kind of looking over the horizon of the, the event horizon of the earth to where right at the last minute you can see that's actually, um, something that's practical, that's going to be coming to market, that actually is going to be successful and, and, and generate revenue and build successful companies. That's a time period we set it being, say, five years out. And we said, that's where we work. See, we say today, 2018, today is an idea that actually started in 2013. And today, we're working on things that you'll be seeing in 2023. And if your company, if that's of interest to your company to work with a partner like that, please, you know, um, give us a call. There's so many things that you said there that I love and, and that I want to just sort of emphasize for a second. One of the things is a lot of companies look for an expression of the brand that is sort of almost, I, I describe it as tactical. And, you know, we make cars, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. some kind of, and what you guys did was you created a conversation starter. Um, which in a company like yours on a B2B level is, is so important. But still you have this issue of they're just words on a page, right? They're just words. How do you, and, and let's talk specifically about a, a program that really brought the idea to life. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. And, and because we did hit that problem. We're saying five years out, we're saying all this stuff, we're talking about it. But at some point, you need a tangible proof point that what you're saying is, 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 is credible and legitimate. And it's difficult for Arrow because a lot of our relationships are, say, with government entities or military or, or, or people that are in competitive situations where we're not really, we can't really talk about them. You know, we can't talk about, hey, you know, here's, here's what the next, you know, consumer device is going to look like because we're working, and because it's, it, it, that'll violate all sorts of, uh, 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 confidentiality uh, requirements. So we decided to set upon, for the first time in the company's history, let's just go build something ourselves. Let's build something that demonstrates our heart, our belief system, and our technological chops and our prowess. So we found a young guy who, uh, his father was a race car driver. He was racing in Mexico. He crashed and he became a, a paraplegic. I mean, you talk about risk, you know, like driving a race car. This little boy watches his father become a paraplegic, but he continues on to race himself. And he becomes a very successful race car driver. He, he races Indy cars, and he's racing in an Indy car, and he gets a crash, I guess, and he's hospitalized, honestly, for six or nine months, and he's all busted up. He comes out of the hospital, and, and he gets back in his Indy car for the first time, and he's down at the Disney World track in Orlando, and he hits the wall. And now this little boy who saw his father paralyzed is a, is, is now a quadriplegic himself. Mm. And that's it. His racing days are done, obviously. He's in the hospital. He gets out. He goes on in life, you know, to kind of be a successful business person. And that's great. And he actually goes on to own his own racing team. But his racing days are over. His name's Sam Schmidt, and we met him, and we thought, Here's a story. Here's a story that can demonstrate what we believe, what we stand for, and what we can do. So Arrow set um, <clears throat> out to build a car, and we took a, a racing Corvette that Sam Schmidt could drive as a quadriplegic. And to, to this day, we call it the Sam car, but his name is Sam Schmidt. But Sam stands for semi-autonomous motor car. It's not fully autonomous, but it's semi-autonomous, and he can drive it with his head. And he So here Sam drives this race car with his head around the track in Indy, and we get 
all kinds of media coverage and attention for it. And the employees are celebrating. Our customers are saying, wow, this is the kind of company we want to work for. He went on to drive that car um, uh, up the Pikes Peak Hill climb, you know. We, we, we were, I mean, talk about risk. You go off a cliff, you're dead doing that. Um, he raced it. We got, he got it up to 190 miles per hour. He actually went head-to-head -head in a race against Mario Andretti, which was kind of fun. And there's all these accomplishments and so on in this car driven by his head. But i got to tell you, Drew, last year he accomplished the most amazing thing in this entire endeavor. Sam Schmidt got his driver's license. Such a and cool he took story. his kids for a for a Sunday drive, the kind of thing we take for granted every single day, and totally changed his life. Now this initiative has been featured on Jay Leno's Garage. It's been on NBC Nightly News. We've had over two billion earned media impressions on this thing. So it went crazy, from a marketing perspective, from an awareness perspective, from a, a you know any any possible metric you put on it for us. It was a wild success. And it said, we guide innovation forward, we're five years out, and we work on technology to benefit humanity. Totally transformed the company, totally uh, uh, pushed us into the, the, the dominant position in our industry, this initiative. And, and, and really, at the end of the day, it's, it's storytelling against values and words and, and phrases and ideas that we cook up in the first place. It's a, it's, it is, there's so many more things that I want to talk about with this program. So, but we're going to take a quick break. Um, and when we come back, we're going to dive in. You've used the term storytelling and, uh, uh, it's a perfect one to, uh, to segue to. So, uh, stay with us. Hey, it's Drew. I wanted to use this break to ask you a single question. Are you a courageous marketer? Do you have the courage to go to your board of directors and say marketing could drive the growth of this company? We just need three times the budget. Do you have the courage to take the big idea that you already have and extend it internally and externally through influencers, through the media, through all of your content? If you're a courageous marketer but aren't sure how to roadmap all of this, I have a big idea for you. It's called Renegade Thinking. It's a program that we've developed and work with exclusively for B2B marketers, generally at large companies. And I want to give you my cell phone, 917-679-8852. Just text Renegade Thinking to 917-679-8852, and we can talk about how you can cut through. Okay, we're back, and my guest is still Rich Kyleberg of uh, Aero Electronics, and we were talking about uh, what they call the SAM car, uh, which stands for both the, the man, the driver, and uh, I'm going to link uh, on the show notes page on Renegade Thinkers Unite to a number of the videos. It is an amazing story, and I actually looked at that story pretty carefully, and paralleled it with the hero's journey, you know, the sort of the classic hero's journey. And it's unbelievable. It actually matches it step <laughs> by step. And it's just, it's, it's, it's such a great heart wrenching story of overcoming, uh, a huge barrier, uh, with arrow in the role of sort of the wizard, if you will, you're a sort, you're Obi-Wan Kenobi to, uh, yeah. to, to Luke Skywalker. So I'm curious in developing a program like this, what were, were there some internal barriers? I mean, what were some of the, cause it sounds great at the end, like two billion impressions. Wow. This thing, there must have been, um, some doubt. I mean, what are you doing, Rich? I mean, you're building a car. Uh, did you, did you encounter any, uh, naysayers and, and what, what kinds of things did you need to do to lay the groundwork for, for this program? Yeah. There, there, there. I think with anything like this, there are um, the only thing that's guaranteed is that you're going to come across naysayers, um, particularly in a company that's successful. It's doing good things. I mean, and, and and you're not really you're not able to. I'm not able to anyway build a program like that and and put it out on a in a business plan and and run a you know stream of cash flows and check the IRR on it. Um, because there's so many intangibles to it. And so, you know, it gets back to that risk. So you got to say, is this a reasonable risk? Now, we certainly mitigated risk by, um, one, 
um, starting out, you know, uh, we actually started out building, building a car that could be driven by a paraplegic. Um, once we had done that, it wasn't very expensive. We just kind of modified a car, but we realized, you know, other people have done this before. This isn't really demonstrating anything special about Arrow. But um, we learned we learned a lot about you know there are medical issues dealing with uh, uh, the, 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 working with disabled people. We, we we learned enough to be dangerous by building a paraplegic car. Um, and we thought that from that experience, it wouldn't be that far to to make a car that could be driven by a quadriplegic. And to be perfectly honest with you, you know, it's not like we invented the car. We <laughs> we bought a car. Right. I mean. You know, the Corvette guys, they wouldn't even give us a car. We asked them, would you give us a car? We think we're going to do this. They said, no, we're not going to give you a car. So we had to, we went to a lot and we bought a car. Hilarious. You know, I mean, and and then later that, you know, they, they told us, you guys can't modify a car like that. Said, we, we said, why not? We bought it. <laughs> we own our car. You can't tell people, you can't tell us we can't put fuzzy dice on the, on the mirror. It's our car. And so it was really quite, quite funny, but, um, the actual technology behind it, there were engineers who set up a small group, and they work on weekends. It really integrated systems rather than building some kind of new technology. Uh, we had partners at the time. Uh, Ball Aerospace was a partner. The U.S. Air Force were partners. We had partners who were all contributing to it. Um, and so the risk was mitigated because the risk was kind of shared. And for a company of our size, uh, the, the risk really being, you know, integrating some systems while well, we bought a car and some engineers' time it was it was worth it, but I, I did have people along the way say, "I don't get this. We, we're gonna we're going into the we're gonna sell cars now. We're, we're gonna sell what are we what are we doing? No, no, no. It's it's this is a this is a, a brand. This is a marketing campaign. This is not um, a, a, an ongoing business venture. Although it has turned into revenue from the automotive manufacturers as a result, a lot of revenue. But that wasn't that wasn't the intention, and um, it was just just to tell stories." And and I think that the people who um, people would try to try to get in the way or be naysayers, um, but they but, but but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't because I think it was because they were afraid. And as long as a couple of us said, "Look, it's our necks," they say, "Okay, it's your neck," um, and we were allowed to proceed. And it, it was taking one one bite at a time, and it was one of those perfect projects that lent itself to that. You know, I don't think some of the stuff that, you know, SpaceX is doing, you know, it doesn't lend itself to one bite at a time. You just got a heavy investment and here we go. Yeah, no kidding. That's really, yeah, right? Uh, but when, 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 when other companies are, 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 and it doesn't matter the scale, but if they feel like this is risky, I think for marketers to find ones that have a path that allow themselves to take one step at a time, one proof point at a time and, and boil the frog, I guess they call it, yeah? Um, there's, there's probably a better better chance of success. And, you know, it's interesting that today with the SAM cars that the, the, the big question here at Aero Electronics is, oh, what's next? What's the next one? What's the next one? Yeah. So that's really the pressure we, we face, right? And, and we work with you on that, Drew, to try to help us. This is hard to do. How are we going to do it? And, and I, and I want to talk about that, but I, before I do, I want to just sort of wrap up because there are a couple of things that, that you said that, uh, that struck me. I mean, you, you were able to sort of start small, but you had to put those ROI hounds on hold and say, we don't know wh- how this is going to pay out. Cause you had no idea you were going to get two billion PR impressions that the employees would rally around it, that revenue yeah. would ultimate. You didn't have, you know, all you wanted to do was do a tangible demonstration that we are guiding innovation forward, right? That was it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I, I want to make that point so clear to everyone as you're thinking about your marketing campaigns. It's not about the words. It's about the things you do. <laughs> right. And this is, yeah. you did something and, and this program has now has a sort of a life of its own. Uh, are there yeah. any other lessons as you sort of think back on the, the Sam car that sort of gave you the courage to, you know, to go for it other than being able to do it step by step? Yeah. I, I you know, it's interesting because you just, you just, it, you just struck a chord with me that a lot of what we did w- was hidden. I mean, in a way, you know, it, it it wasn't like we put together this big plan and said, you know, here's how much a Corvette will cost, here's how much the technology costs, here, you know, and, and add up all these numbers and put them in front of people. 
Um, but a lot of the work around the SAM car was, was mind work. It was figuring this out. It was talking through it. It was taking time. And people were, the company would allow, would allow us to do that because it wasn't, it wasn't as clearly seen as investment at that time. It was like, well, I don't really know what Rich and his team are doing, but I got a lot of work I got to do on my own. So I'm not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to chase him down and, and have him, you know, uh, show us time card and justify everything he's been doing. So a lot of activity around that, uh, was done kind of without anybody knowing about it. And I don't think anybody really caring about it. And then it wasn't until we actually had some material results and people are looking at it and going, wow, that it actually hit people's radar. And it, in some ways, by that point, it was too late to, one, either stop it, and, and two, it looked good enough that you'd want to keep doing it. So I think for some marketers, if, if marketers are really working with their, you know, closely with the, you know, they serve on the executive committee here and the other other uh, executives that run, you know, either business units or corporate functions, um, spending a lot of time bringing them into projects too early when it's just going to scare the daylights out of them is probably counterproductive. But bringing them in at a point where you really have answers and things are really looking like they're going to work um, is probably pretty smart. I don't know about you when you were doing the big wheel or when I was, you know, when did you tell your mom what you were doing? Never. Probably, yeah, yeah, <laughs> never or kind of after the fact, yeah? Because yeah? if you told her in advance, hey, mom, got this great idea. We're going to build gunpowder. You know, it's going to be a science project. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of begging forgiveness, right? You In these kinds of programs, sometimes you go do it, you get it started, you have some proof that it's going to work. And then you say, oh, by the way, we've been doing this. And I think that's part of the courage that you know we hope to inspire on the show is that if you're looking for the idea from your CEO, mm, I don't know, if you are expecting to get buy-in early on without some proof, you know, we're big fans of piloting things and, and trying it. And, you know, look, the worst that happens is it doesn't work. Um, yeah. Well, and you know what's worse than that is you don't try. Yeah. Because if you don't try, nothing will happen. And you're high, as a marketer, you got to make things happen. So I don't see – I think the bigger risk – is to follow the, you know, with the system, don't do anything because that is just a ticking time bomb for the end of, end of life of, 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 of any marketer. So you were kind enough to mention that, uh, you brought in Renegade at, at, at yeah. most recently. And, and I'm really curious at, at when, when you have this very successful program that's continuing to go and you had iterated and iterated, why, you know, you, you guys nailed it. Why bother bringing in an outside, uh, an outside firm, uh, in to, to even to help? I'm, I'm pretty sure that, uh, the answer is that, you know, you got about a, you got a very little chance of figuring something like this out, you, you know, um, uh, with a partner, and, and he had no chance of doing it without one. Um, when I came to Aero, I, I'm an English major. I'm not an engineer. This is a technology company. I'd never worked in electronics. I'd never even actually been in, in corporate. I, I was an entrepreneur before this, you know? So I came in from the outside, and so I was able to look at something and say, wouldn't it be good? This is a great company with all these smart people. Wouldn't it be cool if these smart people, what if they did something like build a car for a quadriplegic? <laughs> Well, you know, inside the company, nobody's, nobody's going to – really, that's an unnatural act. But outside, it's like, oh, that would be cool. And when you work with, like, you and, and Renegade, you come in and you, you, you don't see the obstacles. You don't see the, oh, we don't have the budget. Oh, this is too scary. This is too risky. You just see the, you see the potential. You see the opportunity. And you say, Rich, what if you looked at it this way? Or what if you, what if you guys did this? And that changes the world. Because then it's like, oh, Drew's got the, Drew's got an idea. Drew's got an angle. Oh, let's let's oh, let's just let's do this together. This will be fun. This will be great. And worst case, we're going to learn a lot from this. Okay, but we're never even going to. We're, we're, it's just going to be hard for us to just you know in our bubble to to come up with the idea. And I think for some folks, you know, they might be you know threatened to have consultants or advisors or people like you come in as if as if it, if if I work with you it means I'm not doing my job cuz somehow you're doing it 
But, but the truth is, uh, here at Arrow, when we, when my team looks at the opportunity to work with you, they get really excited and they say, oh, Rich, oh, we can work with you, we can work with you. I say, yeah, uh, we'll pay for that, we'll do that. And, and they appreciate the opportunity. And that's where we actually get the results, Drew. Uh, you know, and so I'm blushing a little bit here and I am trying to keep this show, uh, interesting to all the folks there. And, oh, sorry. And, no, I love this. Are you kidding? I want you to talk for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, um, I do, there's one thing that I've had, I've struggled to explain to other folks out there and this notion of a plan on the page and the power of that. And, and you guys kind of got excited about that. So I'm wondering if we had a bunch of CMOs in front, you, if you could actually explain this plan on the page thing, at least how it worked for you guys. Yeah. Well, how it worked for us, Drew, was that basically, I mean, we're not without plans, and we're not without ideas of what we need to do. Uh, the, the, the challenge for our group is that the, really those plans and those ideas were pretty far flung, and, and, and I would, I'd describe it as, you know, a plan on a thousand pages. <laughs> we just had tons and tons of opportunity and ideas and things we're working through. And we, we, were, we really just, uh, what we found was in working with you, you came in and and, and, and you just looked over all that. You looked over all the plans we had. You thought about plans we might not have. You came back and you gave me a thousand pages on one page called the plan on a page. And I looked and said, Oh my goodness, Drew and Renegade have really, and, and there's nothing in there that's really particularly new. I mean, it's things we, we were aware of, but they were clearly defined. We've got objectives, goals, strategies, and tactics from you across three monumental initiatives that weren't even really new. What they were was a you were packaging up what we were already talking about doing in a way that it made it accessible to us rather than we were talking about initiatives kind of anecdotally, what if we did this, what if we did that? And you were able to come in and say, what if what if you looked at all of that this way? And it makes um, what we're trying to do here much more actionable. I think you know, in some ways, honestly, Drew, we, we probably would have gotten to where you got us anyway, but you probably shaved, I don't know, three years off the, off, three years off of our journey by making it clear to us and making it accessible, okay? And not just, we're just going to clunk our way that way. Uh, you gave us a light in the, in the tunnel. And it's going to be fun working with you to actually, you know, make it happen. Uh, loving all of this. And I'm going to, I w I'm going to go back to the, and do an attempt at a, a summary of some of the things that we've talked to, uh, and talked about and then come back to you for a second. But so the first thing that I, I heard, and we've talked about this on the show a lot before, when you're going through a, a rebrand of a, of a company, start with your employees. And what was interesting, Rich really talked about researching against them. So you have to get the employees on board. The process is really important. When you ask employees about the company, you've automatically involved them in the process from the beginning, which is important. And then you have a chance of getting them excited about it. There's this difference between uh, a position that is internal language and external language. And I love the way, if you think about these two things, the guiding innovation forward as the internal and five years out as the external. What a simple way for you to understand the difference between those two things. Then you get to execution. And what's interesting is we didn't spend any time, on the, and Rich has created lots of wonderful videos about five years out. What we talked about was the tangible demonstration of this positioning translated into language five years out and showing it because that was awesome proof and then tell it in a story fashion and again I if I dare you to watch any of the Sam videos and not cry I cry every time I watch them that's always it well, I'm an easy cry but it's a good way of knowing whether your story touched someone and it did because this was a hero's journey who had to go through the dragons of of a personal catastrophe both for his father and himself and uh, and was able to overcome these uh, these dragons and and thanks to the wizard of, of the arrow team so again it gets to storytelling but first you have this strong strategic foundation so and then finally the just the notion that you the cmo you the marketer need to be empowered to just try some stuff and you if you're so convinced that you 
well, we can only do things that are going to have a clear payoff. You will never get to an idea like five years out or uh, the SAM car. You just can't. You just can't get there. And so uh, courage takes the ability to sometimes to say, we think we know where we want to get to, but we're not going to hold ourselves and say, I know this is going to work. We just you got to go for it. And, uh, yeah. and you, you know, Rich, you, you, you did. And, and, uh, it's inarguable if you look at the success of the, uh, the SAM campaign and the five years out idea. I mean, where are you relative to your competition six years ago? I mean, you guys are blowing them away. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, we fight the same. We get like five objectives, same ones every marketer does, you know, try to predispose people to buy from us, increase revenue, recession proof our business, positively impact the stock price, try to improve employee recruitment, retention and satisfaction. Same thing. Okay. So you look at our results across that spectrum. Basically our revenue is through the roof. Our stock price is hitting 52 week highs. And as far as, you know, predisposing people to buy from us or whatever, our reputation, fortunes, most admired companies, list okay we have been number one in our industry for five years straight and we had never been number one before then okay and i will tell you that the company that was number one for the 13 years or whatever before we took over they weren't they bounce up and down but the dominant company before we started all this brand work is no longer on the list which i say shows you how quickly you can lose this if you don't stick to it so right now arrow is for the fifth year in a row the number one most admired company in our industry Okay, we're Fortune 1, I don't know, 18 now, going up. Um, our, our employee re- satisfaction rates are at all-time highs. It's all working for us, but we got to be careful. we got to hang on to it. Um, right, you know, there's a lot of talk about a, uh, this former competitor because they just go further and further in the background, and people like to talk about that because look at how great we are. Look at how successful we are. But if we're talking about that, we're not seeing the competitors who are coming at us from the sides right now and we're going to lose it. So I live in a, a state of total paranoia here. But right now, and I think largely because of this brand message and this unification of this great company, um, we're, we're, we're on top. You know, I, I, it's, it, you are, and yet you are continuing to strive to uh, challenge yourself to stay on top, which is competing with yourself, right? You have to, you yeah. can't look at Avnet. You have to imagine that, you know, the next competitor is not, uh, Avnet, it's, it's Amazon, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's somebody else out there. And, and yeah. so, you know, that- it comes back to your, your question of risk too, is, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to feel like I'm done. You know, I'm, I, I can just go ahead and die. I've done my best work. My whole team, this is with the Sam car, whatever we're done. We'll never do anything great again. Um, no, we wake up every day. I, you know, I'm terrified. Like, it, it, was that it for me? Was that all I ever am going to do? Was that all our team is ever going to be capable of? And and, 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 and and the answer is, I hope not. So what is it? What's the next thing? And that's where it's like, okay, let's work with Drew. Okay, what does Renegade say? What is it? Where is it? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And and uh, and that 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 that's the risk we continue to take, which may actually be rooted ultimately in a bigger fear than the fear of making a mistake or the fear of doing something wrong or the fear of being laughed at or criticized. But the fear of of mediocrity and the fear of basically, you know, just dying. Well, with that, with that sort of optimistic uh, <laughs> wrap up, I want to, Rich. I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Your you just well, uh, you, your uh, enthusiasm for for marketing and what you do is is infectious. Yeah. I want to thank uh, the listeners as always for for sticking with us uh, and uh, and just. If you've enjoyed the show, one plea from you is it is don't have a fear of sharing it with your friends because uh, we need to inspire these all these folks out there to uh, put their fears aside for a moment or or use that fear to drive uh, some kind of uh, some something uh, amazing that that will really drive your business forward. So until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong. This has been Renegade Thinkers Unite, but it doesn't end there. Just go to RenegadeThinkersUnite.com for more and subscribe to the show. That way, you'll never miss an episode. We'll talk with you next time on Renegade Thinkers Unite.